machine guns. I, we might be streaming. We might be live. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, as always, would require some kind of external Validate validation us. from other people to tell us that we're okay. Nope, that's gonna be confusing. There we go. All right. So as always, somebody please tell me that we exist. And then um, we will be able to, uh, hey there, live now. Okay, great. I think it worked. Right on. Oh, Beth, you're not a moderator here. Oh, stop moving chat. And don't forget to say hello to me and then I'll say hello to you. You're a moderator now, Beth. With great power, great responsibility and all that. A couple more minutes and then I'll say, uh, say hello. Um, Anything interesting happen? There's Morgan. You're back. Wow. I live. And we could have some spotty internet from some of the people. So just be prepared that I may be a super mean moderator and and shut down the conversation if, if we have to. Or we'll just make it up. Um, light pollution bad, Space Force. There you go. Um, all right, I can say hi to people. Hello to Alex Displand, Andy Cowley, Annie Wilson, Aaron C., Astro B., Beth Johnson, Christian Woodland, Cerulio, David Fairweather, Frank Tippin, Giselle Sabrin, John Musk, John Power, John Victor, Jorn Albert, KC61803, that sounds like a star, uh, Larry Beckham, Martin Bradshaw, Nancy Graziano, Neil Yu, Paranor, PsychoCat749, Arjon, Susan Hunter, Susie Murph, Therion, Tim Bargan, Tom Van Scotter, and Zap Van Zap Van. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Two more minutes, and then we'll <laughs> release the Morgan, says Aaron C. He's, I'm here. You're Science only our uh, tamed uh, planetary scientist. <laughs> um, it's good. We actually... Uh, I'm, you know, Paul, Paul is a busy guy, but it's good. We've been, uh, been able to do a little more work with, uh, Brian Coberline, which is great. He is, uh, Brian's just awesome. as skeptical, just as grumpy. Um, you know, you definitely sort of, I, I don't know. Is it, is it a, like, is it like, he even has a blackboard in his background too. Yeah, I know. I, mean, I know. Comes, comes with the territory. At a bit of a different angle, but it's great. So, so we got that, that story about the helical engine, that had been pitched by NASA and a whole bunch of people had been asking me about it. And like, I knew the answer is this thing violates the laws of physics. So, you know, it's a neat idea, but it doesn't work. Can't work unless all physics are wrong. And so, but it was great. Brian wrote an article about it. And so now I can point people at that and I don't have to do a video about it. I think. Um, okay. Well, I think we're, I think we're good. I hope. I'm going to put you all back in your boxes. There's me. Get my intro. All right. Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, October 16th, 2019. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, Insight, Drilling Again, uh, Citizen Science Project to Reduce Light Pollution, and the Pentagon Really Wants Space Force. Joining me this week, uh, longtime co-host, Morgan Renberg. Morgan. Hey, Fraser. Happy podcast day. Happy podcast day. Somebody had to say it. We've also got from uh, South Africa, uh, Alan Versfeld. Alan. Hey, Fraser. How are you doing? Good, good. Um, I like it. You're like in a library, bookstore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we just moved house and we just started to put the books up behind me because it looks cool. <laughs> That's good. It's good to have your priorities set, you know, mm. as long as the telescope's set up somewhere, right? Uh, yeah, it's somewhere. It's in, the, uh, it's in a storm at the moment. You just moved. So we'll have it <laughs> well, up soon. Good. You just got the books out. <laughs> Um, yeah. And then we've got Moya McTeer. Moya, welcome back. 
Thank you. It's so good to be here. And uh, you uh, you don't have books behind you. <laughs> I don't have books behind me because I'm in a bar right now, uh, in the basement of a bar. I want to be there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm impressed that I want to be there. Yeah, that we're not hearing the sound of the bar. So I think, uh, well, I think whatever uh, sort of sound insulation they've got, it's pretty good. Yeah. All right. So before we get into uh, our special guest, um, we uh, just want to take a second and uh, make an impassioned plea for everybody who is listening to this show live or after the fact to take a second and go to the Weekly Space Hangout crew, create an account, set yourself up, become one of the executive producers of the show. And by executive producer, I don't mean like some kind of fancy word for the you donate money to us. What I mean is you are in charge of the show, you choose the guests, you reach out, to whoever you want to show up and and have us interview them. Uh, so that's how this show works. Um, we just do our part and really it's the Weekly Space Hangout crew that is the heart and the soul of everything that we do here. So be part of that community. It's free and you get limitless power. So go to wshcrew.space and they will hook you up. And as always, a big thank you to Nancy Graziano who has organized Oh, so many guests, and we couldn't do this, especially, especially without without you and the rest of the team. All right, let's get in to this week's special guest. Joining us from the Planetary Science Institute is Jeff Cargill. Jeff, welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. Hey, Frazier. Uh, good to be here. Now you are uh, in uh, Tucson, Arizona. We've had a bunch of people from the uh, from the Planetary Science Institute. It's possible that we are, with our work on CosmoQuest, are kind of involved with the Planetary Science Institute, and so I yeah. think uh, you know we've got a lot of friends there. But who are you, and what do you do? Uh, okay, well, uh, you introduced me. I'm Jeff Cargill. I'm a senior scientist here at the Planetary Science Institute. Um, many people uh, know of me as being at the University of Arizona, where I was until uh, uh, last year. And um, so I'm a glaciologist, I'm a geologist, and I'm a planetary scientist. And uh, much of my work, especially in the last 20 years, has pertained to ice in some way, on somebody, um, here on Earth, in the Himalaya, in Greenland, in uh, glaciers around the world, um, and in permafrost in Alaska, for example, but also uh, gla glacial landscapes on Mars, um, paraglacial landscapes on, on Mars, and also ice in the, uh, on the icy moons of the outer planets, and low temperature aqueous geochemistry and low temperature hydrocarbon geochemistry. Uh, a lot of geomorphology. I sort of do a lot of stuff. Uh, now we, you know, I, I think here on Earth, I mean, I hope that many people have had an opportunity to see a glacier up close. It's a just a phenomenal thing to be just this gigantic wall of, of ice. Um, we're really lucky where I live on on Vancouver Island. We have a, a glacier that hangs over our city and uh, it's there all year long. Um, so. I mean, if you were to travel to other places in the solar system, how would glaciers look similar or different to maybe what we're familiar with here on Earth? I'm assuming with different kinds of ices, different kinds of gravities, things get weird. Well, well the, the most exotic looking glaciers, if there are glaciers, would be on Titan, where they're not made of water ice at all. If there are glaciers, they would be made of some kind of hydrocarbon. Uh, we suspect that there may be glaciers possibly uh, in uh, Titan's recent past because we see some valleys that look suspiciously like they were carved by glaciers. But we only see a few pixels across, uh, radar pixels uh, in the synthetic aperture radar images, where we have really very good evidence totally compelling evidence for extraterrestrial glaciers is Mars. And on Mars, we think they're made of good old water ice. And um, the, the thing is, with the glaciers on Mars, um, the ones that have attracted perhaps, well, my greatest interest are those that 
the middle latitudes of, of Mars, like 45, 50 degrees south and north latitude. Um, they're completely dirt covered, dust covered. So we don't see bright, shiny glaciers like maybe your your uh, Vancouver Island uh, glacier. I'm not sure about that one. But, oh, yeah, it's uh, very shiny. Yeah, yeah very bright. Uh, on Mars, they're completely covered with dust. But we know that uh, in many cases, at least, the dust is very, very thin, like maybe millimeters thin, um, because uh, ice pre penetrating radar is able to go right through them, right to the bed, sometimes 400 meters down through the ice. We know that they're made of ice. Um, before that knowledge, uh, that confirmation came, um, I knew they were glaciers, but a lot of people disputed that idea. That that was uh, an idea based on the geomorphology, the form of them. They they look like they're flowing, and indeed uh, they must be flowing, but probably very very slowly. We have not yet seen um, actual measurements of the flow of the ice, and it's they're probably flowing at speeds of under a millimeter wow. per year. Right, and they're much faster here. Now, yeah. is that a factor of the um, the lower gravity sort of pulling the glaciers less slowly, like less? The, uh, clearly, when, when you have a body with four tenths of uh, Earth gravity, um, for everything else being equal except for gravity, the, the glacier on Mars is going to go much more slowly, but not that much more slowly. We're talking about maybe an order of magnitude more slowly, not three, four, or five orders of magnitude right. more slowly. The biggest difference seems to be temperature. Mars is just a heck of a lot colder, especially at those latitudes. And so the ice is much, much stiffer. Now, and again, more, you know, slowly. Uh, you know, here again in my land, where I live, we had heavy glaciation during the last ice age, and we have these amazing. Um, I mean, many of the features are were driven by glaciers. The yeah. fjords that we have everywhere. The you know, you can see these parts that were just great. There's like gouges in these rocks. We have these these glacial remnants, these big rocks just sitting in the middle of nowhere. And you're like, how did a rock get there? So our landscape was really driven by glaciers here. Um, yeah. We've got like one little corner of the island of Vancouver Island that 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 didn't get glaciated and the rest of it was. So what you know, how much of, say, the landscape of Mars or some of the other these other worlds were really impacted by glacier? Is it the primary or or a fairly subtle effect compared to other weathering? Well, um, if you you're asking me, uh, I've been accused of wearing glacier colored glasses. So I see glacial landforms over almost all of the um, middle and moderately high uh, latitude areas of Mars. Uh, either that or they're very, very young landscapes that have overprinted the um, uh, the glacial landscapes. But I think where where there is pretty much something verging on a uh, consensus among Mars scientists is that certain areas, especially the uh, mountainous uh, uh, rings of the Argyre impact basin, this huge, huge impact basin, uh, multi-ring basin, uh, they were heavily glaciated and gouged out much like uh, you know, you're familiar with on Vancouver Island. And by the way, here in the United States, uh, your uh, Canadian glaciers uh, bless the Washington state with those same uh, type of gouged out uh, relief forms. So on Mars, we see very, very similar U-shaped valleys and high mountain cirques, these amphitheater shaped uh, bowls of, uh, you know, left by glaciers that used to be there but now are gone and uh, but on mars they are huge these features are much bigger than most uh cirques on earth by uh, easily typically a factor of five to ten wider um and i think that partly attests to 
uh, greater duration, temporal duration of glaciation, gouging away at, at the Martian surface uh, compared to the Earth. Um, I think partly it gets back to the gravity factor that uh, the lower Martian gravity tends to help uh, glaciers select out broader scale wavelength forms uh, for, the, for it to work on and accentuate right. those. And then smaller uh, wavelengths are wiped out by uh, glaciation. Now, here on Earth, of course, glaciers are used as as a way to really see the history of the atmosphere on Earth. You take these ice cores, it tells you what the Earth's atmosphere was doing at different periods of history. Um, what kinds of, you know, we could go to some of these other places and do ice core samples on yeah, Europa or Mars or Pluto or Titan. Yeah. What what kinds of things could we learn, do you think? Well, um, starting with with Mars, which uh, is, is the most familiar to us in terms of both the landscapes and and the the material that caused the glaciation, that is just ordinary water ice. Um, we, we have a, a pretty good indication that uh, there uh, was accumulation of ice over very, very long periods of time, forming layer after layer after layer, much like the Earth's glaciers. Maybe the time scales are different, but that's where we would want to go there and find out, learn what those key time scales are for the layer formation. Uh, where mixtures of ice and dust, and sometimes maybe alternating layers, would, would form or slightly dustier, less dusty ice. Um, but also, just like with the Earth, where uh, the, the richness of the Earth's ice, uh, ice cores comes from, in part, from the uh, co-accumulation of atmospheric gas in, in the snow when the glaciers accumulated. And at first, it's just fluffy snow. Uh, connected with the atmosphere. But over time, that snow gets buried and the grains start melding together and start closing off the pore spaces. And it, it makes bubbles, trapped bubbles. Well, those are bubbles of Earth's atmosphere, which accumulated at the time of the snow. And the Earth's atmosphere has not been constant in composition, especially in the amount of uh, the key greenhouse gases um, carbon dioxide and methane. But in more recent times, uh, since this advent of the, uh, since the industrial revolution, and even, even a little bit prior to that, we see the effects of uh, anthropogenic additions to the atmosphere in terms of soot, in terms of various uh, volatile uh, components of the atmosphere, uh, pollutants, uh, in, in terms, you know, since uh, first um, atmospheric nuclear explosions went off. We wow. even see um, um, tritium, for example, which is you know radioactive yeah. hydrogen, and um, you know in fact that's used. That's been proposed as one demarcation of the so-called Anthropocene. You know the right. age of of humans. So we could know when the Martians had their global thermonuclear war. We could sort of take that back <laughs> yeah, to basically the, if they yeah. had one. Yeah. Uh, tritium would, uh, presuming that that the the ancient um, uh, Lowellian civilizations uh, died out a long time ago, yeah. maybe from their nuclear war, uh, the tritium would be long extinct. But uh, presumably, uh, whatever went on, you know, seriously, dust storm activity, uh, changes in evaporitic salts from yeah. uh, from dried lake beds that would get swept up by the wind, you know, those would be encapsulated in the ices in, in a very nice layered sequence. Right. So we could ices. see like when was the most powerful global dust storm in for however long that those glaciers were formed. Incredible. Exactly. I've got a couple of questions that I want to, from the audience I'd like to throw your way uh, before we wrap this up. Um, Arjon asks, how different is the geology on a planet made of mostly ice like Pluto rather than Mars? Well, and of course, Pluto isn't even just made of water ice. We, we do think there's water ice there, but it's mostly covered up by nitrogen ice and methane ice and uh, little bits of carbon monoxide and, and various uh, some some trace organic materials. And so um, so but in a certain sense, ice is ice 
whether it's nitrogen ice or methane ice or carbon dioxide ice or water ice, it's, it's a plastic material in that uh, when it's subjected to the uh, stresses uh, exerted by the weight, uh, by the mass and the gravity, the weight of, of that ice, it flows. It's a ductile material. And so it, it exhibits uh, solid state glacial deformation. And if it flows at the bed, which is usually where the flowing is most vigorous because that's where the ice tends to be the warmest due to the geothermal heating, heat coming up from the interior of these worlds, then uh, it has a chance to gouge away at the, at the bed. Now, if it's frozen to the bed, like some of the Earth's glaciers in the most extreme like some of the coldest Antarctic and Tibetan environments are, then, then it doesn't do much erosion. It just, all the deformation occurs above the bed surface and it, the ice is just locked onto the rocks and it doesn't do much erosion. But if there's liquid present, even small amounts, then it slips. You all know that, that wet ice is slippery, at least, well, I guess most, most people know that. Yeah. And, um, and it's true of wet ice on rocks. And so it slips away and it has a chance to gouge at the rocks and produce these, uh, you know, your amazing yeah. uh, Vancouver uh, valleys. And presumably the same kind of thing could happen even beneath a nitrogen uh, glacier if it reaches the melting point of nitrogen, which may or may not on hmm. Pluto. And so, I mean, you could get the situation where these different, the ice and the nitrogen, one is acting like the rock and one is acting like the ice, right? The, the water yes. in this case. Yes, and, and a water ice would act like the rock. Right, which is so amazing. Uh, yeah. It gets that yeah. cold. Uh, well, it is Jeff, amazing. absolutely fascinating. Um, where can people find out more about what you're working on uh, these days? Oh, uh, so uh, if we're talking about uh, popular science literature, well, or I mean, your I hate journal to, articles, or, I hate or to or point you to a 15 year old do. book, but my book, Mars, a warmer, wetter planet. Perfect. Uh, and, and it's uh, designed partly for the scientists and partly for the lay public. And I don't know if I hit either one right, but uh, I tried. And uh, so, uh, yeah, Mars, a water, warmer, wetter planet. If you're talking about, um, Glaciation on Earth, uh, well, there's my technical book on global land ice measurements from space. Um, both of those books are by Springer. But, um, you know, th there, I, I think it's probably not very hard to uh, Google up some more uh, lay public. Fantastic. Um, yeah, sorry to fall flat on that answer. No, it's okay. It's okay. I, you know, I can definitely respect when a person isn't uh, hooked in on all the Twitters and social medias and they instead do things like write books and write uh, journal articles. That's, uh, that seems like a good optimization of your time. Uh, Jeff, <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. We really appreciate it. Uh, absolutely fascinating. I now need to order a pair of these glacier glasses and, uh, and I, I look forward to being able to see the whole world uh, the same way that you do. Uh, yeah, in, including Vancouver Island. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, as long as we, as long as there's last, anyway, it's 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 disappearing. So, Jeff, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Come back when uh, when we when we get those core samples from Mars. Sure thing. All right, take care. All right, so we're going to shift gears now and go on to the news portion of this week's episode. And um, let's let's try Moya. Let's see how your how well your internet holds up yeah okay uh we got to try at some well, point yeah we'll try it now i wanted to take this week as an opportunity to try talking about something that is not science uh, i i saw a story about the space force and i thought huh i don't really know what the space force is let me look that up and so that's what i did that's what i'm gonna give you that's awesome uh, yeah, so the, the reason that this is news is because yesterday some officials from the Department of Defense had a meeting at the White House to discuss the Space Force. Uh, and I'm going to give you a little bit of history about the Space Force in case you're not up to date, because I definitely wasn't. Uh, so all the way back in June of 2018, Trump told the Pentagon to start planning for the Space Force. And some important context for that was that uh, back in June of 2018, Congress was still 
controlled by Republicans because the midterm 2018 elections weren't until November of 2018, uh, which is when Democrats took over the House of Representatives. Uh, then in August of 2018, the Pentagon, after doing the planning that President Trump asked them to do, they released a report with more details about the Space Force. And so they uh, decided that it was going to be fully independent by 2020 um, and that they would invest billions over five years into this force. Then uh, in March 2019, so we're getting into this year, the Department of Defense proposed, uh, they wrote a uh, an official proposal to Congress saying that they want five billion years, five billion dollars over two years, not five billion, five billion years. Five billion years, they'll get it done. <laughs> Those are It'll astronomical <laughs> uh, So they want two billion dollars over five years and they need about 15,000 personnel total, uh, which is a big ask. And then uh, flash forward to about September of this year, and the Pentagon activated a precursor to the Space Force called the Space Command. Um, so it's not officially the Space Force. It's kind of like a, like a mini Space Force, like a diet Space Force, almost. <laughs> Tiny Space uh, Force, can, yeah. Yeah, you can actually follow them on Twitter if you're interested um, at, uh, oh, it's, oh, I have it, I have it up. Space. It's at uh, Space Command. Space so, Command. AF space is their handle. Space um, AF. AF so, space, so, it, right. yeah. so the, the interesting thing about the Space Force right now is that it's not official. Um, in fact, the, the current political climate and the impeachment uh, investigation that's going on right now might mean that Congress might not um, approve funding for a new branch of the military, which is what's being proposed. Um, so they have in 2020, the Congress will get together to decide the new defense budget. And there's no guarantee that they're going to approve $2 billion over the next uh, five years. Um, and then uh, I think it's interesting that the, the House of Representatives and the Senate both have different ideas for what they want the Space Force to be. The Senate uh, really wants to give the Pentagon everything they're asking for. And so in 2020 alone, they really want to give uh, $72 million for the Space Force uh, to make it its own independent organization. Um, million with an M? Million with an M. Right. Yeah. Um, the, the House of Representatives only wants to give it uh, $13.5 million, again, with an M. Right. Now, my, you know, I mean, we have actually talked about Space Force quite a bit. I know Morgan was involved in some of these conversations, so I'm sure he's going to want to jump in at some point. Um, but, like, there is already a lot of military happening in space already that, I, you know, I would say that space is as militarized as the Outer Space Treaty will permit at this point. At this point. So yeah, do we it, have a better idea on what in space they're going to do? It was pretty unclear to me, too, uh, why we need a, a specific space force. Um, and it seems to me that it's mostly organizational. It's not that they're going to do any new stuff that other branches of the military or government aren't already doing, but that uh, all of the space related activities, so anything that has to do with satellites or um, monitoring, yeah, mostly satellites, like any satellites that monitor things on Earth or monitor what other countries are doing on Earth or in space, uh, the Space Force will specifically take on those of responsibilities from the Air Force uh, and and other military branches. Yeah, I think that's pretty much right. Uh, if you want to take sort of a charitable view of Space Force, the idea would be that by consolidating the federal government's myriad space activities into uh, one place, they'll be able to operate more efficiently uh, and, and effectively. If you, if you think about it, kind of space is so new that it has come around sort of since the federal government has more or less looked like it does today. Uh, and if you go back to the early era of the space race, you have the Navy and the Air Force and even the Army all doing their own space things, all competing to launch satellites into space. And so sort of from day one, there was been this sort of separation. And within the Department of Defense, the Air Force now sort of has uh, control but you have things that are happening in uh, the FAA and you have things that happen through the FCC. And of course you have things that are happening through NASA and through NOAA and through all of these government 
uh, branches. And so the sort of generous view is that Space Force will consolidate military adjacent space activities and NASA will consolidate civilian adjacent space activities. And then if you're say SpaceX looking to get a launch license for your next Falcon 9, you have a one-stop shop to go to somebody who can give you the approval for that launch and classification that you need and approval for the radios that you'll need and the airspace that you'll need and all of these things. Uh, uh, now, yeah. Whether that actually is what's going to happen is is a totally different for, sort of up in the air question. Yeah, I, I think that that's uh, that's a good view to take. Uh, that it will make thing it will make those types of things easier. You'll have a dedicated group of people to talk to about space uh, related issues. But I, I wouldn't. I would hesitate to say that that's going to make things that that's going to optimize things. I think it's going to make things uh, bureaucratically difficult uh, and really, really expensive. I mean, you're talking about adding an entire new branch of the military uh, that takes money, it takes time, it takes personnel. And uh, when you add all of those up together, I think you get a lot less efficient, actually. Yeah. So, so what is out. sort of yeah. the, like at or this point, but I mean, you know, we had heard originally when it had been proposed, it was definitely in the billions with a B territory. They were talking about all kinds of new missions, training, things that they would do. Mm -hmm. It really sounds like that budget is coming down and down and down. And at this point, it's a fairly minor amount of money that's being being set aside. So what is sort of like the latest status of it all? Yeah, so it's, it's still billions with a B uh, over a couple of years, but it's uh, millions with an M for the, the first year right. of operation. Um, and that's even if it, if it gets off the ground. So what has to happen for Space Force to become an official new branch of the military is that uh, the House of Representatives and the Senate have to both agree on their proposals for the, and it has a, a, the National Defense Authorization Act. So they have to take their two separate proposals and negotiate to get one proposal to discuss in 2020. And then they have to vote on that act. Um, and so the negotiation is going to take a, a long time. It's going to be really difficult. And there's no guarantee that Congress uh, with a House of Representatives that's controlled by Democrats will approve any bill that gets put in front of them. So it, the Space Force might never get off the ground. Huh. We might be stuck with a space command. One One thing you'll notice if you look at both uh, versions of the NDAA is that they include money to sort of study Space Force. And, and if you're in government and you want something not to happen, but you don't want to kill it, the thing <laughs> you do is you study it. And that study can take six months or six years or however long it takes for people to forget it's happening. And so mm -hmm. there are sort of serious concerns both among uh, senators and representatives in both parties about whether this is the right thing to do. But coming out, if you're Republican, blatantly against President Trump is not a good look. Uh, if you're a Democrat, coming out against the military is not a good look. And so you, you know, you kind of dole out tens of millions of dollars for some think tank somewhere to study the impact of Space Force. Mm -hmm. And you hope that something else comes and distracts everybody and you don't have to worry about actually doing something. In but it does kind of feel like we are at a at a sort of a turning point now in our use of space. And I'm going to talk a bit a little bit later on about that, you know, about the 30,000 new satellites that SpaceX has uh, proposed to launch. Uh, so so space is becoming a really serious and, and if the Starship does work and it, they can launch 10 times a day, <laughs> then then it becomes a, you know, a much more serious thing. So it's, it feels like it is just a matter of time before so much work is being done in space that, that it's inevitable that you do need a very specific kind of group that is monitoring, doing reconnaissance, and checking. Do you think it needs to be a, a militaristic group or a civilian group with, with for research and, and legal consulting? Yeah, who knows? I mean, but I mean, like, like, what is the Coast Guard, right? I mean, the Coast Guard is a pretty similar version of that, but there's a certain amount of reconnaissance. There's a certain amount of preventing reconnaissance. I mean, there are satellites going up now that are starting to potentially uh, run up against um, what's permitted in, in the U.S. So I think, I mean, who knows? Uh, 
if it gets to a certain size, then it makes sense to hive it off into its own group. But as I said, the Air Force and the U.S. Reconnaissance Office, they really have got space militarized. I mean, you know, the, the only thing they're not doing is sending nuclear weapons to space, and that's because they're not allowed. But Don't worry, we're looking out for Canada, too. Yeah, you're looking out for Canada, too. Oh, thanks. Stand um, down, sir. Now, what about the name? Um, I, I, you know, like Space Force, it's kind of cool. Um, I, you know, I sort of think about, um, you know, Star Command. Like, so I think really to get people behind it, it's got to have a good name. Yeah, uh, I agree. I mean, I think anything with space in it is going to sound kind of ridiculous right now to most people. <laughs> um, well, I think Moya's right that, you know, how this you know where how this is perceived is going to sort of define what it does and the name plays a lot in that you know space force is sort of like air force it's sort of like star force it's it has this sort of militarized edge and you compare that to the faa the federal aviation administration yeah who has like first last and all say in everything in u.s air airspace you know that's not you know the the uh federal air defense uh administration or something it you know it has this sort of neutral name and and if you really wanted this to be this sort of one-stop shop neutral arbiter of space for the spacefaring future that you know you and and elon are imagining i think you would want a name that uh doesn't have those sorts of connotations starfleet uh people are zap fan is wondering uh where the stargate will be will go who will have who will be able to? Uh, oh, you mean you don't already know? It, well, it's in Cheyenne, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't know, but maybe it's in Cheyenne. <clears throat> I don't. Uh, thanks, Moya. Uh, Morgan, you're on my screen right now. Uh, what do you got for us? Yeah, since March, we've been tracking the struggles of Insight as it tries to drill down into the Martian surface. You know, Insight landed last November and successfully deployed uh, both its seismometer and its drill to carry out these these experiments, and it got to work. Uh, and the drill started going in, and it went in, and then it stopped. And for a long time, we didn't really know why it stopped. A lot of people thought, including people at, inside of NASA, that it might have hit a rock. And this was always something that, that was possible, but not likely because of where they picked. And it, if it was a rock, it wasn't really clear that you were going to be able to solve the problem. So they've been studying it. They've been taking pictures from all these different angles. They've been kind of poking into the ground, trying to see what happens. And nothing. Uh, and they've sort of finally deduced that probably what's happening is not a rock, but that the soil itself is not the consistency they expected. You might remember that they landed in sight in basically the safest, softest, fluffiest place on Mars. And they did that to make the landing easy because they didn't care about what was on the surface, but also because, you know, what we sort of generically refer to as the drill is not really a drill. Uh, it's more like uh, like an impact screwdriver or something where you have a hammer that's basically trying to hammer this thing called the mole down into the ground. And the mole carries with it the end of the thermometer and is supposed to drag that out through, you know, several meters of soil. And the design of the mole assumes that uh, it's basically always surrounded by Martian regolith. And, and that seemed like a pretty good... Uh, expectation because again they were landing in the softest fluffiest sandiest place on Mars and when they landed they kind of poked around in the soil and it seemed nice and fluffy uh, and now what it seems has happened is the drill had gotten far enough down that it had reached uh, this sort of crusty harder part of the surface and it's kind of like imagine trying to like nail uh, you know hammer a nail into a hole that's too big you know it's not gonna stick and so Every time they would try to drive the mole down, it would basically bounce back up because there wasn't enough friction from soil around it to kind of grab it. You know, it was supposed to get hit, go down, and the sand kind of collapses in on top of it, holding it down. And then they hit it again, it goes down, the sand collapses down and holds it down. And the sand wasn't collapsing, and so the mole was just bouncing back and forth. 
And so they devised this uh, sort of nifty idea, which was to use the sample collection shovel to kind of push the, um, the drill bit, the mole, against the side of the hole, where there's supposedly going to be enough friction to uh, make the uh, to, to provide that the friction to hold the mold down. And this was kind of uh, tricky and they've been struggling to actually get enough force from the shovel because they put the mole as far away from insight as possible because they wanted to keep it out of the shadow of the spacecraft so that that shadow wouldn't affect the temperature measurements that, that the thermometers were making. But when you put it as far away as you can reach, you know, all of us have tried to reach for something that was barely in reach and you have basically no leverage. And so they really had to kind of manipulate things to find uh, an angle that will let them use the shovel to push the drill bit against the uh, edge of the, the hole, basically. And the hope is, is that this, this thick, crusty area is not particularly deep because eventually they're not going to be able to push it far enough against the edge of the hole in order to keep that friction. So the idea is, can we inch our way past this point and then the mole will continue to work as expected. Uh, and we got word via Twitter this week from NASA that uh, the German space agency who's managing this part of the mission started a new campaign of hammering and they've successfully moved the mole a few centimeters lower than uh, previously. And so there's no guarantee that that means that it'll keep working, but it's farther than they've able to uh, have gotten before. And it seems like this shovel leverage thing is working. And so That's fingers crossed that it'll keep working for as long as it takes to get through this crusty part of the surface. That's pretty incredible. Um, you know, just I don't know how to... you figure this out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, they had thought it was a rock. And now, in fact, using this technique, they've been able to go down, a, you know, an, enough to prove that it's not a rock. So now the question is, will this process work? And I want, you know, I, when you look at that picture, you can see that it's got about another few centimeters until the shovel is sitting right on top of the probe. And then maybe they'll, you know, they'll try to push down with it. And then at a certain point, they're not going to be able to, to go any deeper. And I wonder if they can then come up with some other hack to go a little deeper. Or yeah, you know, use the shovel to they sort won't. of backfill it and, and tamp it yeah, down. Yeah, well, they, they, tried, they tried that, and that didn't seem to be enough. And so they devised this, this leverage approach. And hopefully there's only a few centimeters more of, of this crust. Uh, now, the good news is, is that the rust of inside has been working great. And the seismometer, um, which they were worried might be disturbed by all the camera motions and shoveling that they've needed to do to try to diagnose this problem has found uh, more than a hundred seismic events already uh, in this first year on Mars. And so that tells us that we're gonna be able to build up this seismic picture, which was sort of the other principal goal of, um, of InSight. And it's been re returning all the weather data it was supposed to and the photographs it was supposed to. So really it's, everything's going swimmingly except for this darn mole. And if they can just get it past this tough spot, then it seems like it'll be smooth sailing for, for InSight. Um, our Joan is asking, uh, do we know how deep it needs to go before it can start doing some science? Like it's meant to go down about three meters, isn't it? So, yes. And I think if I remember back to when we first were talking about this in the spring, I think I remember that they thought it needed to go like at least a meter to really give any sort of useful information. And right now it's like closer to 10 centimeters than it is to a meter. And it's supposed to go three to five meters. And I think starting at three meters, they can get sort of all the science they want. It'll just take longer. The deeper you go, the faster, the bigger the temperature differential is and the faster you can make your measurements. Right. At three meters, they can get everything they want just slowly. And at maybe a meter, they can start to do some sort of like A versus B comparisons against the surface. Yeah. But right now they're in the zone that's basically in equilibrium with the surface. And so there's not much to be learned. Well, this is great news. I love incredible spacecraft rescues. You know, when you think about even what happened with Kepler, figuring out a way to to use the light pressure of the sun to be able to keep the satellite pointed. Um, and there's been so many other examples where 
all hope was lost. You think about like the first Hayabusa that limped back to Earth and was able to give a couple of grains of, of, an, of an asteroid back into the atmosphere. And so this is another example where you've got the, just this ingenuity of the so scientists. satisfying as an engineer yeah. to like, this must be the pinnacle. You, you're so frustrated that you have to do it. But when you solve it, it's got to be the best. Yeah, I just can't even imagine. Right on. But I also feel like it, it's probably so tough for them because they know all the details of all the work that went into doing this problem solving and like no one else understands and very few <laughs> other people actually care about all the details. Yeah, like, yes, we thought of that. Yeah, like that's how I feel when I debug a code and I'm trying to explain exactly what I did to someone else. And they're like, I just, I don't care. Stop talking. <laughs> yeah. And and exactly. they are just like living in the guts of this problem for day after day after day and it all unfolds. I mean, you think about it, right? Like how long has it taken now? Like the better part it's of a six year? Six months, basically. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, six months to get to the point of let's try pushing the side of the shovel on the probe and see if that helps and and like just the amount of tests and math and fluid dynamics and so on that were required to get to this point is just mind-bending and so i can totally see you would almost want to like quickly perform all these different let's try this let's try that but everything's got to be done in super slow motion but yeah uh, boy i know ex i think i know exactly what you're talking about all right, Alan, what do you got for us? Yeah, I want to talk about light pollution briefly, um, which I don't know how badly I need to explain exactly what that <laughs> yeah, is. Like scourge uh, but, of the universe, yeah. <laughs> yes. As, you know, as astronomers, we've been complaining about it for uh, forever, you know, ever since the first electric lights started spreading through cities and we had to start shutting down observatories and moving them onto remote mountaintops and what have you. But in recent years, it started getting a lot more traction in fields outside of astronomy, you know, with its ecological impacts and potential health impacts as well, uh, which means we're getting a lot more proper study and research being done by real scientists and not just, um, not just people bellyaching about how it's affecting our observations. That needs data, though. Uh, light pollution data comes when well, you get your local measurements. Uh, you, can, you can use proper dark sky meters or apps like Lost of the Night or what have you. Um, but for your large scale data, what you tend to use is satellite, uh, satellite imagery. And then you can just map out. I think, I think we've all seen those, uh, those websites where they show you a dark sky map and you yeah. can see how badly lit your city is. Um, the problem with this is, uh, uh, with the satellite data, is that it tends to be repurposed. You know, it's, it's not, these satellites were not made to measure light pollution. They have some other purpose and they tend to be quite narrow in their wavelength that they're looking at. Um, and so what we have now is, according to that data, it seems that light pollution is getting better, but it's not. And the problem is that as LED lights are rolling out uh, with much bluer light, these satellites aren't seeing the blue lights. And so they report less light pollution oh. when in fact it seems to be getting worse. Huh. But there is one source of uh, satellite imagery and that is uh, full color photographs taken by astronauts in the ISS. Um, and I believe there's over a million images that have been captured so far over the years, which seems incredible. These guys must be very busy, but you know, how many years has it been? But there's a problem with this, which is that most of these images are not, they're not uh, categorized, they're not labeled. So you have a picture of a city in the archive, um, but which one is it? So it's not useful. So that's where this, uh, uh, there's a new citizen science project out called Lost at Night, which is an unfortunate name. I think it clashes with Loss of the Night, which is a, a different app, also measuring light pollution. Uh, and basically the idea is uh, it's um, the same approach taken by projects like Moon Wrappers or Galaxy Zoo, where they just present people with data. Here's a photograph of a city taken at night and you need to try and identify it. Hmm. And to make it easier, what they, they will show you um, a number of other images that have been identified. So here is London at night, here is uh, Bern at night or what have you. And the idea is you can then try and match and compare them. And if you find a match, you tag it and then we've got it confirmed. And the long-term goal is not to do all the classification in this way, but rather to train bots to then be able to process it automatically because the volume of data is just so big. Uh, yeah, so that is that's, lost. And this, that's is the, really cool. this is the future of, of citizen science, I think, is 
citizens mm-hmm. are going to become less and less useful or needed for like actually <laughs> making the determinations and more for creating these big labeled dating sets to turn machine learning onto. And it seems like lots of people, CosmoQuest included, is looking at uh, how they can leverage these amazing uh, annotated data sets to, uh, you know, bring up your uh, efficiency by, you know, 10 or 100 times. Uh, and mm. computer scientists around the world are desperate for these labeled data sets. And so, you know, we're sort of training the robots to replace us. Um, Alan, do we have any idea mm. of like how much of of the Earth has been photographed at night in a similar format that we can start to piece together a map of the of the earth you're talking from the iss yeah yeah i mean these i mean these these photographs they're all sort of taken by the by astronauts on board the iss and they're like literally just taking a picture out the window Mm -hmm. and i guess i mean i can see that you've got these places like they're taking a picture oh like i'm over london again that's my home i'm going to take a picture and the you know the last time somebody did that you know 18 expeditions ago and now we can kind of compare mm. and contrast light pollution in these in these different areas and use this as a, as a sample right i would imagine that most of the images will be of cities because it's nighttime and they're just using a regular camera so there needs to be something to look at um, and in fact this project focuses entirely on cities because that's really the only kind of matching that they can that they can do easily um, i think it's unfortunate that they wouldn't be able to do much or if they even do much call for something over, say, the Pacific Ocean, you know, there's, there's simply nothing. Well, I lie. There's fishing fleets and right. there's, uh, you know, what have you, which are quite quite atrocious. But, but yeah, it's 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 generally uh, urban areas where there is already uh, light that can be seen from space. Um, uh, Beth Johnson is uh, asking, what are the kinds of street lamps that cities should be switching to? If you were uh, wanted like the best solution to light pollution um i mean obviously just turn off all your lights and stumble around in the dark Mm -hmm. that's what the astronomers would appreciate but what can we do to try and minimize the amount of light pollution that's going on well there's so much i could fill an entire episode talking about this um (laughs) well you've got about (laughs) three minutes Okay, very quickly then, as an astronomer, I would say uh, apart from having properly designed fittings so that the light is pointed down uh, try and minimize light escaping upwards. Uh, the use of uh, high pressure sodium or, or uh, those very um, th- those, those colored lights, you know, the, the ones that are that are deep yellow, uh, because it's, it tends to only be a single wavelength, and that makes it very easy to filter it out. Um, that astronomers love that, but the problem is we don't know what effect that has on ecological impacts. How does that affect wildlife and creatures and plants and what have you? This is why so much research is being done actively now that it has come to the attention of biologists and ecologists and what have you. So jury's still out on that, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a it's a big problem, and there I mean there are some parts of the world. I mean, he, again, here in Canada, I'm really lucky. I can see Milky Way. But you look at some of those dark sky maps of people in Europe, and they have no place they can go. I mean, they literally, mm. if you're in Belgium, I always pick on Belgium because it's like, looks like it's just the worst. <laughs> There's just like no place within your country <laughs> that you could go that you could not have brutal light pollution in the sky. Like you can go out into the ocean maybe or drive to yeah. the alps or something but apart from that it's it's rough and it's getting worse and worse and worse and and this is mm. one of these things that we're just we're losing our connection with with the night sky and uh and that's really sad i like for me being able to see it i really appreciate it mm. and so then to not be able to see it is just is rough what i find tragic is that a lot of the areas that still have dark skies tend to be the poorer nations where electric lights is seen as a symbol of modernity it's uh we, we we have the money we can uplift ourselves now and part of that is electrifying um the cities and bringing the lights in and it's only when it's gone that you really appreciate it that uh, and miss it and i think the the weird thing that's happening now is you've got this ink because the leds require less power then people are making things brighter because you can use less energy to illuminate a larger area more brightly and so so the sort of the tyranny of this, you would think that with these these directable lights facing down, you can, you know, you can be a lot more careful about where you put the light. But the reality is, is that because you can you can have ten times as much illumination for the same amount of energy, 
and they, and these bulbs are lasting forever, uh, mm. the light pollution is getting worse. Well, you say that, but of course, with bulbs lasting a long time is a problem that they're working to solve because it's bad for business, well, right? You can't have that. You sell one light bulb and then you never sell another one. <laughs> so, right, yeah, yeah. Oh, and of man. course, the extra intensity ends up being self-defeating because... You know, you want it for security or for visibility, but you end up creating such high contrast situations with deeper shadows. It all comes down to the light design and keeping the brightness yep. low enough. But anyway. All right. So we're uh, down to the, just the last couple of minutes. So I just wanted to give you like one quick story. And this is that um, some sleuths on Twitter uh, have realized that um, uh that SpaceX just submitted in early October a request to the FTC to launch uh, the FAA to launch another 30,000 satellites as part of the Starlink constellation. And that would be on top of the 12,000 satellites that they had already put in for the existing constellation. So you would be looking at a total of 42,000 satellites in various orbits going around the earth. So um, right now, uh, you know, there's this first 60 star Starlinks are already up. The next batch is probably gonna go within about a month and they're planning to do another three by the end of the year. And the thing that's kind of interesting with Starlink right now is that SpaceX has now gotten so reliable with their rocket launches that in fact, they're having to wait for the satellite manufacturers to be able to get their their payloads ready to go. And so this is part of of SpaceX's plan is that if a if a customer isn't ready with their with their payload, then they'll just launch a, a the Falcon 9 with a with a set of Starlinks and then when you know and then offer up another and the thing then the thing will come back down it'll be reused and they'll launch it again with whatever the payload was so so it's sort of an interesting way to deal with this mismatch between when the rockets are ready and when the payloads are ready at this point if a rocket is ready and there's no payload then more Starlinks go up and now it looks like you know there could be 42,000 of them I now, saw somebody online who calculated, like, if assuming you take the lifetime that that Musk has talked about to sustain this fleet would require uh, three Falcon 9 launches a week in perpetuity or 28 Starship launches a year. Uh, you know, it seems like even as successful as they've been, they're so far away from doing three Falcon 9 launches a week, yeah, every week, every rain week. or shine, storm or not. Yeah. More and more, yeah, yeah. It's, it is, uh, it's just bonkers. And you know, apparently the next set of Starlinks are going to be painted black on the bottom. So, but the solar panels are still going to be kind of reflective. So, um, hopefully, they will deal with the light pollution issues. Um, but still, it all remains to be seen. But we are in brand new, brand new territory now. On the one hand. I don't want star trails going through my astrophotography, and I know the scientists are even less pleased with it. On the other hand, I want to have internet in in places away from the city. So, you know, I am torn. All right, Morgan, you're on my screen right now. Tell us uh, what you're up to and uh, where people can find out more. Absolutely. You've only got a couple more months to come and see uh, my big space exhibit exhibition at the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History called Launchpad, all about uh, the history of landing on the moon and the future of where space exploration might take us. Uh, since I was last on, I've had a number of videos come out on SciShow Space, including a neat one about different shapes of meteorites, uh, as well as one about some out there propulsion mechanisms for CubeSats. So some neat stuff to check out over at youtube.com slash SciShow Space. Awesome. Uh, Moya. What are you working on? Hello. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, immediately after this, like in less than a minute, I have to go and do a set in a comedy show. Um, and you can find me on Twitter. I'm go Astro Mo, or you can go to my website, moyamictier.com to figure out when I'm doing other things. And if people have like one minute to make it, where can they watch the show? And will you do another one? Uh, I, so the, the comedy show isn't being streamed, uh, but if you find yourself in New York City, uh, you can come down to Caveat on the Lower East Side uh, every Wednesday at 9.30 
uh, that's the show. Right on. Alan. Yeah. Uh, so if anybody wants to help in this project, uh, they can find it at lostatnight.org. Um, I'm quite a fan of uh, Loss of the Night as well, which is an app where you can just go out and basically count stars and tell it what you see. And my own work, you can uh, you can hear me on the Urban Astronomer podcast, which is on the same location as the old Urban Astronomer blog, urban-astronomer.com. Or you can follow me on Twitter at uastronomer. Awesome. Um, of course, uh, I've got an endless stream of videos coming out. Um, my Our next one tomorrow, Friday, is all about all the times that we discovered life in the universe and we were wrong and that we didn't freak out. So just to let everybody know that we won't freak out when we find life in the universe. Again, <laughs> wrong. All right. Um, so thanks everybody for watching this week. Uh, thanks to my co-hosts. Uh, thanks for a special guest who stuck around. Jeffrey, you're still there. Um, and uh, thanks to the moderators and everybody watching the show. Uh, we couldn't do this all without you. Don't forget to go to the weekly Space Hangout crew, wshcrew.space, and we'll see all of you next week. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. And... Gotta stop.